So, you are doing predicate logic proof theory ok. There is some uh, uh, there is some small changes uh, from last times uh, lecture. So, I think uh, we should just quickly go through the changes uh, um, because of certain certain proofs uh, I had to make some changes. So, so let us uh, let us go to let us go th quickly go through last times lecture and then we will come to this. Um, uh, Right. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, as a matter of terminology, uh, so uh, you uh, the the proof theory for any sigma uh, first order logic uh, essentially consists of some logical axioms and rules, and some non-logical axioms. So, of course, it's possible to separate them out. Uh, so, in, uh, so the so we the first order theory with no non-logical axioms. Uh, is called a predicate calculus, a first order predicate calculus, and uh, it's a it's a good idea to look at the properties of first order predicate calculus before we go on to the first order uh, any other first order theory because all of the first order theories are uh, um, essentially um, depend on the signature and the axioms uh, through the non logical axioms. So, whereas uh, this one just looks at logical validity itself for all possible kinds of different signatures. And so, we will actually look at uh, first order predicate calculus before we go on to any other first order theory. Uh, right. And then, um, okay. so uh, there is a small change here, this for all d. Um, there used to be a quantifier for all x. So, I actually said that for all x distributes over this arrow, um, but now I am actually putting some restriction. This is because of some proofs, uh, I, there is some problem with some proof. Uh, so, it had to be in this form. Yeah. So, if you if x does not have uh, small x occurring as a free variable, uh, then what it means is that uh, rather than distribute this quantifier for all x you can push it in right. So, that so then this capital X uh, bec becomes uh, quantifier free and uh, so um, okay. So, that it it's, it's, it, it, it adds a certain extra power for the purpose of certain proof rules uh, and uh, its validity is not in question because if x is anyway not a free variable of x then even if you quantify it uh, over x uh, it does not matter. But this form has some advantages. The other thing is uh, this uh, I have also made this I think I do not know I think it was not in this form when I spoke last time, but uh, this universal introduction universal quantifier introduction or what is known as universal generalization. Uh, so, I am writing it in this form essentially what I am saying is. Um, if you ever oh uh, I think I I think I had it in this form last time also. So, this, so there is no problem. So, essentially this means that if you can uh, if this y is a completely arbitrary variable then you can quantify it over x. Uh, the notion of arbitrary needs to be captured somehow symbolically and that is uh, that can be a problem, um, but um, okay, we went through all this this is all fine. Okay, uh, of course, we have to look at the sequent forms of these uh, rules because uh, and uh, this the sequent forms uh, are essentially of this kind. Uh, now, that in this in the sequent form what we are saying is we assume that there is some set of assumptions gamma for any first order theory uh, it will be the axioms the non logical axioms might form gamma. So, so we have to look at. So, uh, we, so, this so this gamma is therefore, important um, while we are dealing with predicate calculus it does not matter whether we look at use it in the sequent form or in the non sequent form, but the moment we talk about a first order theory uh, we are talking about a set of non logical axioms which will be there in gamma. Um, here again uh, there is a small change here in the universal generalization. Um, So, now if you have a collection of formulae in gamma 
and uh, if y occurs so y obviously occur, uh, might occur free in this y for x of x right i mean so however if y occurs free in some other formula in gamma then there is no guarantee that that y is an arbitrary y i mean the meaning of the word arbitrary has to be captured somehow if that y may not be arbitrary then you cannot necessarily generalize on it if however y occurs uh, free only in this expression capital uh, capital x with y substituting x and this proof goes through then it does not depend on any particular value of y and therefore it can then be generalized okay so i mean that is the intuitive reason in a formalization one has to worry about what are the freely occurring names right so if y is if y is a name occurring in more than one of these assumptions uh, in one or more of these assumptions and it also occurs free in this uh, hypothesis uh, then uh, it means that that y is some particular kind of y i mean like uh, like socrates for example s it's not then it's not you cannot gen directly generalize then because it might uh, because under certain interpretations uh, so it, uh, this 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 may not, for example then uh, if you generalize then you you're not you may not preserve validity because that if that y stands for only certain particular values for which this predicate is true uh, then it does not generalize to all values and that is the intuitive reason why uh, we require that this y should not be uh, should not occur free anywhere in gamma either anyway if y occurs bound anywhere in gamma it does not matter because that those bound y's are different from any free y right so the the notion of y being completely arbitrary is only guaranteed if it occurs free in this formula and if it occurs free in some other formula also in gamma that means you are it's like this you take um, you take the identity element for example so predicates dealing with the identity element cannot be universally generalized because usually in a, in any algebraic structure there will be a single identity element all other elements are not identity the identity might have a variable name or it might be even if it is not a constant uh, this the set of predicates the assumptions that you might make might uh, with with some free variable y might imply that that y should stand only for the identity element in which case you cannot generalize arbitrarily right i mean that's the intuitive reason why you require that this y should not be a free variable anywhere in either in x or in any of the assumptions in gamma if it does occur then you are not necessarily preserving validity uh, if you uh, if you generalize on y whereas uh, if it does not occur free then this y uh, replacing small x and capital x and occurring free is essentially an arbitrary y it's not a particular y and hence uh, can be generalized yeah i mean that's that's the intuitive idea why uh, you need to be careful about the occurrences of free variables right so in the sequent form we will actually use uh, universal generalization in this in this way the okay so then there was this case of equality ha huh, right um okay so in the case of equality of course uh, uh so the, the semantics of equality is something that we'll fix because it's something that's going to be there in all algebraic structures uh but however keeping in mind the fact that syntactically distinct terms under certain interpretations might lead to the same uh, value in the structure uh we have to define the semantics of equality essentially as this so s and t might be two distinct terms uh and under any interpretation a with a valuation va uh this equality is true if the valuation the value of s and the value of t are the same in in the structure a and otherwise it's false um and since equality is uh, sort of special 
uh, we can also talk about uh, first order predicate calculus with equality, right. Uh, so, which means that uh, we have to look at there. So, I mean um, now it is a debatable question uh, whether the equality axioms should be considered non-logical or logical. I mean equality lies somewhere in the interface between the logical and the non-logical. It is uh, uh, you so, uh, but uh, I mean so because of this uh, we might actually so you have actually a first order predicate calculus with equality where equality is regarded as one of the uh, logical uh, and special binary relations uh, binary predicates that should be available let us say. So, that may not be true always. So, um, so let us so that is called first order predicate calculus with equality. So, let us look at the axioms for equality and I, I think ah uh, that is right. So, firstly of course, I have made a correction uh, instead of x equals x I decided to make it for all terms t right. Uh, so, this is, a, the, this is the reflexivity property. The second thing is that I had this notion of replacing 0 or more occurrences. Uh, now, I have uh, I have made that more uniform uh, through this uh, substitutivity axiom right. So, if s for x and t for x are both admissible in x then s equals t arrow s for x of x arrow t for x of x yeah. So, now it is uniform substitution and all occurrences all free occurrences of x would be substituted. This has some advantages right okay so substitutivity is uh, is this axiom and it's actually a very powerful axiom um, so so one thing is that uh, normally uh, any equality relation is also an equivalence relation so uh, what you expect is that uh, uh, what you expect is that the properties of symmetry and transitivity should also hold uh, but this substitutivity axiom in this form is so powerful that we can actually use symmetry and transitivity as derived rules basically. And uh, so, here is a symmetry rule and uh, so essentially, uh, so essentially if I take s equal to t as an assumption and I take this formula x equals s. Okay, one, one thing of course, is that x might occur free in s for all we know is it can x occur free in s I mean, x could occur free in s. I mean there is this question of whether x is recursively defined in which case whether you are finding a fixed point and so on and so forth, but purely syntactically speaking there is no reason why x should not occur free in s. Uh, in which case you can it can also be substituted. So, which means that you might actually substitute a free occur uh, a term containing a free occurrence of x for occurrences of x uh, in this predicate and uh, that is not unmeaningful I mean it is not meaningless I mean in the sense that it is still it still bears a syntactic meaning uh, which can be uh, which is acceptable okay. Uh, what I mean by that is that this kind of substitution or uh, substitution does not get you into the okay so so this this proof essentially shows that if i take this formula x equals s then by the symmetry rule and uh, and and so on i get s equals s implies t equals s s equal to s is of course a uh, reflexive rule and so and you have got an assumption s equals t. Uh, so, you can use modus ponens twice uh, to get t equals s right. So, you can actually prove the symmetry. Uh, so, which means you can take symmetry to be a derived rule uh, rather than um, rather than fundamental rather than a basic uh, rule ok. Uh, transitivity is uh, also provable actually. Uh, so, here again we take here we take so, there we took the formula x equals s in the case of symmetry here we take s equals x. Uh, so, you are you are given assumptions s equals t and t equals u and you have to prove s equals u. 
So, I am going to take s equals x as uh, a formula and uh, then, uh, then it is very clear that uh, I have t equals u imp arrow s equals t arrow s equals u. Basically, I take this formula of psi and replace um, t for x and u for x on these two sides. right? Uh, and I have got the assumption t equals u, uh, so which means I can use modus ponens twice and finally, I will get s equals u. Yeah. Uh, so, it is enough to have just these two, um, it is enough to have just these two axioms for equality and uh, the other two axioms can be uh, derived. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, now today we let us continue with predicate logic. So, so we are going to obsess with uh, free variables and bound variables for some time because that is actually crucial for various things. Um, so, exactly how can you capture the notions of arbitrariness, how can you and we will obsess with it also for existential quantifiers later because there there is a question of determining whether a certain name is a constant or a variable which should be treated like a constant and so on and so forth. So, there are lots of linguistic subtleties which have to be taken care of and so we will uh, do this. The other thing is that um, alpha conversion uh, need not be considered basic. I mean some this is one thing you usually in all uh, programming languages and the lambda calculus alpha conversion is considered an absolutely basic thing. Uh, but in a in a minimal powerful proof system. Uh, alpha conversion can actually be proven and that is, so that is uh, that is the first thing we will do now. Uh, however, um, in order to prove alpha conversion we will actually take two uh, formulae phi and psi and uh, this is uh, this is a fairly common notation which I am introducing now for the first time which this essentially says that psi can be proven from phi and phi can be proven from psi. Uh, so it yeah. So, basically it stands for these two statements. Uh, so, which means that you require two proofs. I mean, so this is like this is the proof theoretic analog of if and only if, if you like. right? Um, so, uh, for every formula phi for which y for x is admissible, um, for all x phi proves and can prove can be proven from for all y, y for x of phi. Yeah. So, um, the first thing to realize is that uh, if y for x is admissible in phi, then, um, then it means that uh, firstly x is not a free variable of y for x of y uh, of phi. Uh, therefore, x for y is also admissible for y for x of y of phi right and actually if you take x x for y in y for x for phi then you get back phi it's actually a syntactic identity right so these this left hand side and this right hand side uh, after all substitution is a meta syntactic operation right it's not it's not a syntactic operation it's a meta syntactic operation expressed in this fashion so, these two are actually syntactically identical formula. Right? Um, further, x is clearly not a free variable of for all x phi. So, which means that I can apply the uh, universal instantiation rule for all e and for all elimination to get for all x phi arrow phi where of course, I am going to take this phi as basically obtained from phi by two substitutions. First y for x and then x for y. Right? Uh, okay. So, which means that I essentially get this as a particular case of the universal instantiation formula. Right? So, if I get this as a particular case of the universal instantiation formula, then I can, then I have I have some trivial proofs, easy proofs. I had to make them small because otherwise it was going beyond the screen. 
so, you can see that uh, first of all uh, from for all x phi I can infer for all x phi and by quantifier elimination I actually get for all x phi arrow x for phi y for x phi and uh, I can use modus ponens and get x for y y for x phi uh, and of course x for y is admissible in this entire thing and x and y are both arbitrary essentially uh, which means I can quantify over this. So, I can get for all y, y for x of phi. Yeah. Um, similarly, I can start with for all x, y for x of phi. I get this, uh, I also get for all x, y for x of phi arrow y for x of phi. Uh, and then by modus ponens I get y for x of phi and since y is arbitrary and uh, is not it does not occur free in anywhere in the assumptions or here or, or uh, anywhere in the assumptions then therefore I can generalize on that and I get for all x phi. So, you can uh, so, so some of these proofs are subtle especially when you are looking at minimality you have to look at these proofs in some subtle fashion yeah. Um, oh is it? Oh, okay, okay. This oh, this is that. No, no. This is that that propositional logic reflexivity. Okay, this is derived by applying the deduction theorem to this this rule. R R arrow. So if you want, I could have called it R or uh, the other no or better better I think to regard this as. Uh, part of that uh, suite where we said that uh, any assumption is also provable from the assumptions. So, that is you can you can think of it that way if you like. Uh, uh, so, maybe it is not uh, okay. so, so maybe I should not have called this r arrow I should have called it um, I mean whatever that monotonicity right any assumption is also provable from the from the same assumption. If actually with the with the if you look at uh, yeah so i think that is the best that is the best bet of given that any formula phi belongs to the assumptions gamma gamma proves phi we had that in propositional logic and, and we had that actually stated in a very general fashion for all theories uh, so there is absolutely no reason why we cannot apply that here yeah so okay so maybe i should not so this justification is probably not right r arrow uh, that should have been the justification from formal theories. What is it? We had those things like monotonicity and so on, right? Ah, yeah, was it here? I thought I had it somewhere. Okay, I have forgotten at the moment where, where it is and if it is not there it should be included actually, but uh, okay, so uh, this all I am saying is I am just writing the assumption out here yeah? uh, and that is true for here also I am writing the assumption out here. Um, the any proof, uh, any formal proof, oh we had this notion of formal proof where each step of the proof is either an assumption or an axiom or obtained from some previous steps by the application of a rule of inference, right. So, this is this is the case of the step being an assumption that is all there is to it, yeah. So, so, th so, this, so this is quite justified maybe this r arrow should not have been there, okay. Um, then, uh, then, then these two proofs go through uh, quite easily, right? Okay, so, so, so actually, alpha conversion is something that can be proven um, by uh, this. So, which brings us to the deduction theorem. So, now the deduction theorem for predicate calculus uh, is a little complicated by free variables, uh, and precisely the notion of arbitrariness actually when is a certain name arbitrary that is the question that basically you have to because if you are ever going to generalize then you have to be sure that you gen, you do not generalize on some 
constant. You don't replace a constant by a variable and put a universal generalization. You have to generalize on some variable symbol that is somehow guaranteed to be completely arbitrary. Okay. So, uh, we take this in analogy with what we did in propositional logic. So, essentially I am stating this deduction theorem uh, that was in the case of propositional logic it was an if and only if uh, thing with two proofs, uh, but uh, so I am stating this separately. So, one part is that if you do have from a set of assumptions gamma, if you do have phi arrow, if you can prove phi arrow psi, uh, then it is perfectly safe to pull phi to the left of the turnstile. Okay. So, and the proof of this uh, is exactly as in the case of the proposition of propositional logic, uh, because after all the proof uh, involved uh, just using the k axiom. Uh, I think Uh, okay, uh, the, the using the k axiom, uh, right? So this is the, the left arrow, right? So you, uh, so what we are saying is uh, you can actually uh, not the k axiom. Uh, let oh okay uh, by adding but we use the monotonicity by adding an extra assumption like phi uh, to the set of assumptions gamma. Uh, you are not losing anything in the proof. So, you add that extra assumption phi and then you have phi arrow psi. So, if you have a proof of phi arrow psi from gamma, then you have a proof of phi arrow psi from gamma comma phi and of course, then you also have phi and therefore, you can use modus ponens and get psi. So, the this, this left arrow part is actually quite trivial and exactly as in the case of propositional logic. The it is the right arrow part which is uh, slightly difficult. Yeah. The right arrow part essentially says that supposing I have an assumption phi, that assumption phi might have some free variables. No, I do not know the status of those free variables. They could be arbitrary, some of them could actually represent some constants uh, and therefore, only for certain particular valuations uh, phi might be true, but still if you are if I am assuming phi and if I can prove psi, then I can push phi on to the right hand side provided no free variable of phi is generalized anywhere in the proof and that is yeah. So, if a f so essentially if no free variable of phi has been generalized anywhere in the proof and psi also has that free variable as a that variable free, then there is a good chance that that free variable is not an arbitrary variable. It might be a particular, it might be something that is true only for certain values. Okay. So, which means that it is safe to move phi to the right hand side. Uh, provided again actually there is more to it. No free variable of phi uh, should also occur free in gamma, right? I mean any free variable that is generalized should not occur free in gamma, right? Otherwise, you cannot apply this gamma I rule and that actually will distinguish between what is arbitrary and what is not arbitrary, right? So, let us look at the proof of this. So, uh, we are not going to go through the entire proof because uh, for most of the cases like the axioms for example, uh, if you the proof is exactly as in the propositional case, right. So, in uh, we used uh, for example, you take, uh, so let us just worry about the quantifiers and so on. So, you take some, uh, supposing your proof actually has some m formulae, uh, m nodes, it is a proof tree with m nodes, um, the last one being uh, the formula psi which is to be proven uh, from the assumptions uh, gamma and phi. Then uh, essentially what, what we did in the propositional case was that we proved that every step corresponding to the proof corresponding to each uh, gamma phi proves psi i 
there was a proof tree. So, essentially what we proved in the propositional case was that if I had some tree T i in which I prove psi i, then I can construct a proof tree T i prime. Yeah rooted at this, this is what we did in the propositional proof. Yeah. So, we showed that every step of this proof uh, for, for every proof tree of this kind, there is a proof tree of this kind. Right. So, you go back to the propositional proof. And if you see that now one of the things that we did in that propositional case was that for so, so take something like uh, any axiom for any axiom actually and in this particular case uh, it does not matter uh, because uh, we had those three axioms k, s and n and now we have two more axioms uh, for all e and for all d right those two axioms. But regardless of what axiom you are using, you take any axiom for any step for any tree T j rooted at psi j, this you can use the k axiom to get psi j arrow phi arrow psi j and then you can use modus ponens to get phi arrow psi j. So, the fact that we have added some two extra axioms does not change the proof in any way because the proof the proof that you can construct uh, T j prime given T j given T j is just uh, is just an application of the k axiom and modus ponens. We also had a proof for mo uh, modus ponens uh, and that proof is exactly as in the case of uh, propositional logic and there is no change. Right? The only thing therefore, now to worry about is what happens uh, for an application of the rule for all i, right. So, if you have uh, an application, so, so this is another rule, right. So, th these two are axioms, it does not matter. So, now we have to worry about this rule. So, if you do have this rule, then uh, we look at it this way. So, so if you have that means you up you you inferred psi j by an application of for all i on some psi i, right? And this proof is by induction on the depth of the proof tree, essentially, on the levels of the proof tree. So, which means that by by the induction hypothesis, I can actually assume that there is. a proof tree T i rooted at gamma comma phi uh, psi i and uh, correspondingly by the induction hypothesis I can assume that I have already constructed the proof tree T i prime uh, which which has phi arrow psi i right. Given that and given that psi j would therefore, if psi j was obtained from psi i by an application of for all i, then essentially what I have is there is some variable x such that uh, such that uh, such that well psi i is here let us say is that fine and x may have occurred free in psi i. So, x may be free in psi i okay. and uh, basically now what we have to show is that we can construct this proof tree T j prime uh, provided all these conditions are satisfied and what are these conditions? These conditions are just this. So, one thing is um, 
if you prove this, uh, so one, th one thing that your assumption tells you is that no variable in phi has been generalized. So, if you generalized on this x, then x is not a free variable of phi, first thing. And further, if you actually applied this generalization, x is also not a free variable of gamma anywhere, right. Okay. So, so then what you have is, I start with this psi j and uh, I am sorry, I start with this d i prime which proves phi arrow psi i and I generalize it to get for all x phi arrow psi i. And I can apply universal generalization here because x is not a free variable of phi and uh, it's not a it's not uh, it's not a free variable of gamma and so i can do this generalization uh, i have from my uh, new axiom i had a new axiom which says for all x phi arrow psi i arrow phi arrow for all x psi i right x is not a free variable of phi so this axiom so this is why i had to change that axiom for all d so, this is an application of the axiom for all d. Since x is not a free variable of phi, it is because x is not a free variable of phi that you could do this generalization, but given that x is not a free variable of phi, therefore, you can push this for all x inside and you can get this. And when you get this, therefore, then I can apply mode exponents and I get for all x psi i, I get phi arrow for all x psi i and this is just phi arrow psi j. right? And yeah. So, if x had been a free variable of phi, then all these things could not have been done. So, this deduction theorem actually is slightly subtle. So, so this deduction theorem in this fashion, so uh, to actually be able to apply this deduction theorem, most of the time you would not be looking at it in all its subtleties. I mean there is, there is one thing is clear the deduction theorem holds for propositions right so one thing is clear that if you are you take any general theory all your sent all your formulae are likely to be closed formulae because uh, because you are trying to prove general theorems right so when you prove general theorems there are no free variables so, the deduction theorem in its propositional form de becomes directly available. So, actually so a corollary of this is, is the following. If phi is a closed formula and from gamma phi you can prove psi, then you can, you can assume that you can prove from gamma phi arrow psi. So, even if psi is not a closed formula, it does matter, it does not matter, but most importantly if you are proving very general theorems, if all the formulae that you are taking as assumptions are closed formulae like the group theoretic axioms and you are trying to prove general properties of groups, if all of them are closed formulae then their deduction theorem is anyway applicable without any problem, right. It is only when your formulae actually use some free variables that you that you have to be careful about whether you are following the conditions of the deduction theorem before you use it, right. So, essentially in order to prove if phi 1 to phi m are all closed formulae, then I can I can either decide to prove this or I can decide to prove uh, take, take all of them as assumptions and uh, prove psi from these assumptions and both of them are equivalent. And uh, so, the other thing is supposing your proof uh, actually is a proof of some very specific object which has been uh, which is called x let us say and your proof is all about that then you, anyway you would not generalize on it. So, you take any proof which does not have a inv involve any generalization there again the deduction theorem is applicable. So, that is the first corollary. So, if the proof of psi from gamma comma phi involves no generalization of any free variable, 
then from gamma you can claim that phi r of psi is true. If phi is a closed formula, then you can claim that you, uh, fr from gamma and phi if you have proved psi, you can prove that gamma proves phi r of psi. And if all your, if there are no free variables anyway, then you can apply the deduction theorem. The only case where you have to worry about whether the deduction theorem is at all applicable is a case when a generalization has taken place in the proof. So, it requires going through the proof tree to find out whether there is any occurrence of universal generalization. And if you are doing an occurrence of universal generalization, you have to check basically whether the free variables in this assumption phi have been generalized or not. If none of the free variables in phi has been generalized, then you again you are safe. You can just apply the deduction theorem. If a free variable of phi has been generalized or if or you are using some, uh, if a free variable of phi has been generalized then you cannot push it. But remember that normally what you want to do is you want to factor out everything which appears on the left side of arrows as an assumption, right. So, which means you are looking at all free variables of phi 1 to phi m. In order to have these two equivalent it requires that any proof which involves proving psi from gamma does not general, generalize any of the free variables in phi 1 to phi m. If it does not in, but if it generalizes something else, maybe it generalizes a free variable in psi which is not present in phi 1 to phi n, then you are still safe. Yes. So, there are various conditions, right? It, it becomes very subtle at this point. So, under what conditions can you actually check, check whether the deduction theorem is applicable, right. Now, actually uh, it is uh, uh, the question is um, whether I should go into soundness now or postpone that. So, uh, and then, then there is of course, this question of uh, existential quantification also. So, which, uh, but I maybe let us, let us, let us just do the soundness, yeah. So, okay, first proposition, you are, um, I have not actually spoken about existential quantifier, but the, the point is that your existential quantifier is going to be defined by uh, the De Morgan rule, right you are essentially going in a Hilbert style proof system, you are essentially is stating that this formula is being is going to be defined as not of for all x not phi, right. So, you are going to use this definition. So, the notion of arbitrary and particular then take a certain meaning here usually with existential quantifiers right and uh, we have to be able to justify some of the proof methods that we use for existential quantifiers from the Hilbert style system itself. Uh, but that is uh, it is a little complicated, so I will postpone that. Uh, in the meantime let us just look at this uh, uh, soundness. Firstly of course that uh, you take any well found formula which is an instance of a propositional tautology no valuation can change it, no model can change it, it is it's always going to be true. So, tautologousness is preserved by the, by the propositional tautologous forms, right. So, you, you can essentially take, so this proposition I am not even going to prove. Uh, essentially what we are saying is, so that is equivalent to saying that you take any predicate formula which can be derived by just using K S N and M P it is always going to be valid, yeah. So, all propositional tautologous forms with corresponding propositions replaced by predicates do not change their truth value ever and their validity can be proven, right. So, so in that sense K S N and M P are sound rules for predicate logic. So, the other interesting thing is that you take, uh, so uh, I am going to use uh, T H of so, I am looking at predicate calculus itself as a theory, 
you know with these axioms k s n m p for all i for all e for all d yeah and uh, the 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 th of p c stands for all the theorems of this theory right so a formal theory uh, uh, the, so take the set of all theorems of this theory so whatever is provable by the hilbert in predicate calculus by the hilbert style proof system so this theory first of all is consistent that means all the theorems that you prove are uh, have truth values they have models and valuations have interpretations in which they can be made true. It is important because the consistency of this set of formulae is required to show that your proof system itself is sound. Yeah. So, this, so this uh, the consistency of this is uh, just depends upon these claims. So, so I take uh, any any of the any of the theorems, any of the formula in the theory of predicate calculus, some formula phi, and I define what is known as its erasure. Okay, the erasure of a formula is just that I remove everything that is violet in color from it. I remove all the terms. I retain only the atomic predicate symbols and I remove all the quantifiers. If I remove all the quantifiers, I have also removed all the variables. If I have removed all the terms, I have removed all the variables. So, the quantifiers are anyway of no use. So, I removed all the quantifiers. When I remove all the terms and all the quantifiers, what am I left with? I am left with something that looks purely propositional. Yeah? It just looks like a proposition with uh, propositional atoms and propositional connectives like not and arrow and so on and so forth that is all. So, it looks like a purely propositional formula. So, the erasure of a formula E phi is just a purely propositional form with propositional connectives no quantifiers no terms nothing. Now, uh, you take any of the theorems of first order logic. So, you take anything that is provable in the Hilbert style system H 1. The erasure and take the erasure of any of the formulae that you get as theorems, the erasure is always a tautological form for all the axioms. So, for k, s and n it is easy to show that they are just tautological forms. The only thing therefore, it is to show for these two, but for these two you can see I mean if I erase if x is a purely propositional atom and I am going to erase this for all x and I am going to erase all this t for x because I am erasing all the terms there all the violet terms there. So, then what am I left with I am just left with x arrow x which is a tautologous form right. Uh, similarly, in the case of for all d uh, when I do the erasure I am just left with x arrow y arrow x arrow y which is also a tautologous form. Yeah. So, the erasure ensures that you will have only tautologous forms and in fact, uh, so the modus ponens rule of course, preserves tautologous forms. So, that is not the problem, the problem is with universal generalization. Here again when I do the erasure what do I get from x I get x which preserves tautologies. If x is a tautology then x would also be a tautology. So, all so the erasure is such that all the axioms and inference rules of H 1 of the system H 1, the axioms only create tautologous forms, the rules of inference preserve tautologous forms. So, if they had a hypothesis which are tautologous, then the rules would ensure that the conclusions are also tautologous, the erasure is of the conclusion is also tautologous. Right? So, so, so claim 0 essentially says that the erasure of all the axioms gives you tautology tautologous forms. Claim 1 says that the, the erasure in every rule uh, preserves tautologous forms. So, if the hypothesis was a tautologous form then the conclusion would also be a tautologous form. 
and then claim 2 says that the erasure of every formula in P c is a tautology because every proof just preserves tautologous forms. Okay? Uh, so, now uh, so the so you take the erasure of the theorems of P c you will get only tautologies. So, all the sentences in theory, theory of P c you apply erasure on all of them you will get only tautologies. Now, we know that that has to be consistent, but now but that does not mean that theory of P c itself will be consistent, right. It is only the erasure since it produces only tautologous forms it will be consistent. So, now we argue by a contradiction. Suppose theory of P c contains uh, supposing it were inconsistent then um, then then firstly the theory of PC would be the whole language L1 okay? uh, and in particular there will exist two formulas phi and not phi belonging to the theory of PC. But if phi and not phi both belong to the theory of PC then their erasure should both be tautologies, but not does not get erased. So, you will get the erasure of not phi is just not of the erasure of phi. So, you will get a contradiction in propositional logic which is not possible and we, because we know that propositional logic is sound and creates only tautologies. So, therefore, the theory of P c is consistent all right.